Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that you would free me of sin, Lord, that you would cleanse me and make me a vessel for your word here this morning, that the words that I speak would not be my own, but that they would go through me and be what your people need, Lord, that we can put what you tell us through your word into practice in our daily lives, and Father, that we would bring you honor and glory in this world. Father, I thank you for this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, it was very encouraging this morning. Um, I, I gave the, uh, the hymns for our opening and closing song. And I, I made a mistake and I put the wrong number of the, of the hymn. <laughs> <laughs> or, or something like that. Or it was something like that. And, I, and I, uh, I read it and I said, wow, how appropriate. You know, that was so appropriate. So I, I, I thank God that, that for that song. Um, it was beautiful. It touched my heart there in the, the opening song. And it was so encouraging that, that um, though we don't know the right way, though we don't plan our own way, God opens the doors for us and he prepares our hearts into things that, that, that he has for us. And I want to let you know that this, this message here that I'm going to share here with you today, it's been on, on my heart for the last two or three weeks. As I've been reading, God has given me a little bit of light here on, on verses and, and a little bit of stories that fell into uh, an examples of, of what he means by this. And um, I want to start with one example um, uh, about a man. I, I forgot his name, but I heard his testimony. And, and uh, he was high school sweethearts with, with a girl since he was probably, you know, maybe eighth or ninth grade. And he really cared about this girl, and she had cared about, the, about him, and they were friends through, through school. And he steadily gained weight through high school and she stayed normal looking and uh, and he kept on gaining weight and gaining weight but she kept on being by his side and eventually they got married and he weighed 540 pounds that's a lot that's about twice the average, more than twice the average man. And, uh, and he heard the words that other people would tell his, his wife. And he heard the words how they would dis try to discourage his wife or his fiance from getting married to him. And he felt very bad. She loved him very much, and she, there was nothing that anybody could say to defer her from marrying this man because she really, really loved him. And at the same time, this, this man felt very, very guilty that this woman would get married to me because I am the way I am. I'm so big and I, I, I want to marry her. I love her too. But um, look at the way I am. She's a normal, beautiful woman and, and uh, I'm 540 pounds. Well, they got married and instantly, you know, he, he started trying to lose weight. He said, you know, I don't want, I don't want to um, give my wife the burden of all the health problems that are going to come on me. I'm already pre-diabetic. I'm only, you know, 20, 20 years old. Uh, I, I, I'm already starting these health problems. And, and his, his father or grandfather had already died at a very young age because his, I don't know if it was his father or grandfather, very, very young but overweight as well and uh, didn't make it very far in life. And he said, you know, I don't want that weight and, and my wife is so good to me. I, I love her and she loves me so much. I want to give her something better. And so he, he tried. 
And he really tried, and he kept on failing. He'd, he'd go to the gyms, and, and, and he'd sign up, and he'd work out for a little bit, and he'd try this diet, and he'd try that diet, and it just seemed like, like everything he ate would seem like it'd just make him bigger. And he couldn't do it. Until one day, he finally made the decision of sincere... Uh, love-driven repentance and he literally got everything processed everything packaged everything unhealthy in his home and he threw it in the garbage he said there was still stuff that was on that was cooked and he threw it he, th he put it into the he, he was even worried that he might take it out of the garbage so he got that food and he put it down that the garbage disposal thing in the sink so that, uh, so that he couldn't get that, that piece of pizza back out. And, and then he, he, he st really started and he said, okay, I'm not going to live the same because I want to give something better to my wife. Now, we need a sincere will to change. This man, he had that sincere will to change and it worked out for him and he came down and now he is about 220 something pounds but he, he has a big frame so he actually looks like a thin man even though he's 220 um, he he's a healthy guy they they removed about almost 30 pounds of skin from him because he had hanging skin all over the place so it was about 28 pounds of just skin that had to be removed. But he is uh, a healthy man and he, um, he is on his way to a healthy life with his, his wife. And he is surprisingly very strong uh, because of, he was carrying around so much weight and now he's so light. <laughs> so he is, he is a very strong 227 uh, pounds. Now, we need a sincere will to change, but try as we might, we cannot change ourselves. It's a miracle, and it's a miracle of rebirth. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 1, and we're going to read that story about Nicodemus. We're going to go through the, some of the verses here, verse by verse. Now, the name Nicodemus means victory for the people. And we're going to look at verse 3, verse 1. We're going to start off there. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was of that class who kept the law and would study it and was zealous for those things that were written in it. He uh, knew of the law, but Pharisees did not have that understanding of grace. But he went to church. He taught others. It, the Bible even says in Matthew 23, 15, he goes, you go over land and sea to make a proselyte, a convert, but you make them worse than yourselves. So Pharisees, they were doing evangelism. They were out there and they were trying to bring others into, into their same beliefs. So we can see that, that most, most likely Nicodemus was of that class who did evangelism as well. Um, the Bible also tells us that he was a ruler of the Jews. And that's, that uh, portion of the church, the ruler of the Jews, was part of a group of 70. And that group of 70 is called in the Bible the Sanhedrin. So Nicodemus was part of, these, of the 70 who were part of the Sanhedrin. Um, he was in that same group where when Jesus healed the blind man on the Sabbath, uh, they brought 
the blind man before the Sanhedrin and they asked Jesus why did you heal him on the Sabbath so the Sanhedrin saw in the, the, the same hand Sanhedrin who who told uh, that man he couldn't uh, you know he, he he was out of the church same one this was the same Sanhedrin that um, that Nicodemus was part of. Now, in verse 2, we see that the same came, Nicodemus, to Jesus by night. When did he come? By night. Now, when we come to someone at night, or especially at that time where they didn't have street lights, it was because he was timid about someone seeing him or he was worried about his reputation he did not want others to see that he was coming to Jesus or else he would have done it during the day in fact in the three times that Nicodemus is mentioned in the book of John in chapter um, uh, 7 and also in chapter 10 every time it says Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night and so sometimes we have to kind of relate that to us. Are we timid about our relationship with Christ? Do we wear it in the, is it something that we, that we only put on and on Sabbath or when we're around other Christians? Or do we shine bright in a dark world? See, Nicodemus, he came to Jesus at night because he was worried about what other people were thinking about him. And God forbid we would ever be of that group who's worried about what other people think about us because we've come to Jesus. Now, continuing on in, in uh, verse 2, he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now, Nicodemus might have said this out of flattery, but one thing is for sure. Nicodemus noticed two things. He gave, knowledge, he gave, um, he gave uh, testimony that Jesus was a teacher. He knew of Jesus' teaching, and he knew of his works. Therefore, he believed he was from God. When do other people, when they see you and they see what you do, do they come to you and say, what is it about you? I know you're from God. If we are representatives of Christ, then we should shine bright in this world and people should see a difference in our lives. Not that we're, we're one and the same with everybody else and fitting in. We have to be a peculiar people, not a, not a, a sore thumb or, or loose hair. But that golden hair, that, that, that beautiful thing in an ugly world. That piece, that, that person who gives hope when everything looks negative. That person who helps when everybody else has left somebody alone. That's the Jesus that we have to represent in our lives. Now, verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily. Now, when the Bible says, verily, verily, that means, like, that's at the highest. That's like if we put exclamation mark on what we're going to say. This is, this is how... how they would say, this is the truth, or listen, they would say it twice. So Jesus is saying, this is the truth, this is the truth, like exclamation mark. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So immediately, Nicodemus sees that Jesus is telling him this, him, a ruler, a part of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee. This was not a new concept. 
of being born again, of being a new creation. But immediately he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? John the Baptist had already come saying, you know, be born again. He, he's already washing people by baptism. And all the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, they knew what John the Baptist was doing. But he's saying, well, me? Me? Who, me? I'm in church. Are you saying, I'm not saved? I'm, I'm, te I'm teaching other people and I'm, I'm not saved? You mean I have to do something I haven't done already? So he makes the statements kind of, kind of uh, putting what Jesus said to the side and trying to apply it in a literal sense. So this wasn't a new concept what Jesus was, was saying. And we're going to look in that in, a, in just a moment. But it, is it possible that you can go to the right church and you could know the right doctrine. You could have been raised up in the church. You could have been, as they say, born in the church and still be lost. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. And I'm going to read verse 30 and 32. Ezekiel 18, 30 through 32, it says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from all your transgressions whereby ye has transgressed, and make you a, what? A new heart and a new spirit for why will you die O house of Israel I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth saith the Lord God wherefore turn yourselves and live ye so here God is asking that we we repent and make us a new heart and a new spirit a new birth now, this isn't a tune-up. This isn't a repair. It's a transplant. You know, when I, I, I have always been into, uh, and, you know, and since I was a little kid, I was all into cars and different things like that. And, and I really thought it was really neat when people got one engine and they put it into a different kind of car that it what didn't come with, you know. And, um, and that's kind of what God wants to do with us. Have you heard of the, of, of the term and what they say in the cars, they say a sleeper? You know what that is? A, a sleeper, a sleeper is a car that looks perfectly normal, or a car that, um, that doesn't look like it really is what it is. And it's like if a, uh, if a, if a Dodge Caravan uh, pulled up, but under the hood it has you know, like a, the, uh, a hemi or something, you know. So this is that kind of that term. But that's what God wants to do with us. He takes that normal, uh, despicable man or woman that we are, and he puts in us something that comes totally from outside of us. And if it came from us, it would be stained and dirty. It has to come from him. Also, turn with me to Psalms 51.10. Psalms 51, verse 10. The Bible says here, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Does it say fix my heart? Or does it say create in me a new heart? Create, something new. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The word of God is miraculous. It creates a new person in us. 
Too many times we are preoccupied by externals, by what we look like on the outside. But what if we took as much time as we take uh, getting dressed, brushing our teeth, combing our hair, and making ourselves presentable to actually being a service to mankind? Of not what others think of me, but how am I going to help others? Why is it that we need a new heart? Well, the Bible tells us that the heart that we have is desperately wicked. Who can know it, right? I want to share with you a, a quote, and uh, I meant to print it out, but my printer is not working well. And this is an appeal. This is part of uh, Testimonies, Volume 5. And uh, it says, an appeal to be read at camp meetings. And I'm going to read a portion of it. Um, the whole thing is too long. But this was something that was meant to be read at the camp meetings. It was written in 1882. And uh, it says, I am filled with sadness when I think of our condition as a people. The Lord has not closed heaven to us, but our own course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. Pride, covetousness, and love of the world have lived in the heart without fear of banishment or condemnation. Grievous and presumptuous sins have dwelt among us. And yet the general opinion is that the church is flourishing and that the peace and spiritual prosperity are in all her borders. The church has turned back from following Christ, her leader, and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power. Doubt and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches everywhere. Satan would have it thus. Ministers who preach self instead of Christ would have it thus. The testimonies are unread and unappreciated, but God has spoken to you. Let each put the question to his own heart. How have we fallen into this state of spiritual feebleness and dissension? Have we not brought upon us the frown of God because of our actions, because they do not correspond with our faith? Have we not been seeking the friendship and applause of the world rather than the presence of Christ and a deeper knowledge of his will? Examine your own hearts, judge your own course, Consider what associates you are choosing. Are your recreations such as to impart moral and spiritual vigor? Will they lead to purity of thought and action? And what has caused this alarming condition? What has caused this? The same cause of Nicodemus. Many have accepted the theory of truth who have no true conversion. They have been convinced of the truth. I believe it. That's what the Bible says. But they have not converted. They have not let the Bible change their life. Somebody told me the other day, one of the scariest things he hears in the church is, God hasn't, um, what, how did he put it? God hasn't, um, convicted me on that yet when they have a thus saith the Lord but no I'm not convicted on that even though you can read it but it's not a conviction see we can see things and we can say yeah that's that's the Bible says that but I don't see I have to change I don't see I have to do that we have to be careful that we're not only convinced of the truth, but we allow the truth to do its work in us. Amen. Continuing, I know whereof I speak. There are few who feel true sorrow for sin, who have deep pungent convictions for the depravity of this ungenerate nature. The heart of stone is not exchanged for a heart of flesh. Few are willing to fall upon the rock and be broken. No matter who you are or what your life has been, you can be saved only by God's appointed way. You must repent. You must fall helpless on the rock, Christ Jesus. 
you must feel your need of a physician and the only remedy for sin, the blood of Christ. This remedy can be secured only by repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus. Like the Pharisees of old, many of you feel no need of a savior because you are self-sufficient, self-exalted. Said Christ, I came not to, the, to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The blood of Christ will avail for none but those who feel their need of its cleansing power. What surpassing love and condescension that when we had no claim upon divine mercy, Christ was willing to undertake our redemption. But our great physician requires of every soul unquestioning submission. We are never to prescribe our own case. Christ must have the entire management of our will and our action. Many are not sensible of their condition or their danger. They flatter themselves, as did Nicodemus, that our moral character has been correct. And we don't need to humble ourselves before God like a common sinner. But we must be content to enter into life in the very same way as the chief of sinners. We must renounce our own righteousness and plead for the righteousness of Christ to be imputed to us. We must depend wholly upon Christ for our strength. Self must die. We must acknowledge that we, what we have is from the exceeding riches of divine grace. Let this be the language of our hearts. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. Genuine faith is followed by love and love by obedience. His spirit is renewing power, transforming to the divine image all who receive it. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. He feels that he is the purchase of the blood of Christ and bound by the most solemn vows to glorify God in his body and his spirit, which are God's. The love of sin and the love of self are subdued in him. He daily asks, what shall I render unto the Lord for his benefits towards me? Lord, what wilt thou have me do? The true Christian will never complain that the yoke of Christ is galling their neck. He accounts the service of Jesus as the truest freedom. The law of God is his delight instead of um, seeking to bring down divine commands to accord with his deficiencies. He constantly strives to rise the level of, their, of his perfection. Such an experience must be ours if we would be prepared to stand in the day of God. Now, while probation lingers, while mercy's voice is still heard, is the time for us to put away our sins. While moral darkness covers the earth like a funeral pall, the light of God's standard bearers must shine the more brightly, showing the contrast between heaven's light and Satan's darkness. So, we see that that most, most of us, if not all of us, we have seen that sin is so commonplace that it does not repulse us. And we have to come to the point where I'd rather die than to sin. In John 3, 4, Nicodemus asked how. How is this supposed to happen? And in verse 5, Jesus said that we must be born of water and of the Spirit. Water being baptized and of the Spirit. What about the Spirit? Turn with me to 1 Peter 1.23. <clears throat> First Peter 1 Peter 1.23, and it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God. Now, it's not just reading the word of God. There's something special about this. We're changed by beholding 
but many of us here could say, well, I've been reading the Bible my whole life and I'm still attracted to sin. Well, we, we are in sanctification, but what if, they say, what if you say, well, I don't, I don't feel that, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that I have salvation. Or you might say, I do have salvation. I, there's nothing else I have to do. That's more cause to worry. But um, we have to see that it's not just reading the word. It is letting the word do its work. Amen. Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. That word let. Let means that you allow it. But there's something in us that says, No, I want to hold on to that. Don't touch that. You know, I was cleaning out my storage building the other day. And there's a lot of things in there that I'm never going to use. And I'd have a lot more room <laughs> if I got rid of it. You know, our, our hearts can become an accumulation of stuff that's just dragging us down. And we have to let go and say, Lord, I don't need that junk. I want a new life. And take it all. Take it all. And I want a, a, a clean life. I want a new heart. We have to come to that point where we can say, oh, I'm broken. I'm broken. I don't need this no more. And I'm ready to be made new. But there's something. There's something that holds so many back and say, no, you know, I'm, I, there's something that says, I won't let the word go this far. I'll let it come this far. But there's something carnal that puts a stop to us. When we get to the point where we can say, Lord, take it all. I want to be different. I want to be like you. That's the point where we can be broken and we can be made new. Numbers 11.29. Some of you guys probably know that, I'm sure. That verse, Numbers 11.29. I've heard some say, no, you know, it's, it, God just speaks to some. But, you know, that's, that's his choice. He doesn't speak to everybody. And it's the degree in what we're listening is what the problem is. He, he does speak to, to us, but are we, lif are we listening is the problem. Numbers 11.29 says... And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. What is it that, that allows a prophet to be a prophet? They have to hear the voice of God, correct? And when you don't obey the voice of God, what happens to the voice of the Holy Spirit? It diminishes and you don't hear it, right? So we have to come to a point where we begin to listen to the voice of God and get rid of that junk and let the word do its work and that voice will get louder until we, we will know God's will. Now, what is holding you, what are you holding on to that has prevented your re rebirth by the water or the spirit? It could be music. It could be the fashions of this world, the way we speak, our pride, our reputation. Maybe we, we uh, hold on to our finances, our temperance. 
Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 24 through 26. It says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why does the, the disciple of Christ have to take up a cross? Is it to crucify Jesus on? What is that cross for? Yes. <coughs> to crucify self. We don't want to crucify Jesus afresh, but we need to crucify self. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I, was, uh, I saw a documentary on, on uh, you know, when they slaughter animals and they show you how ugly that is and everything. And uh, they were showing how sheep are slaughtered. And it, it was different from other animals. Very, very, very different. You see, sheep go crazy if they know they're in a dangerous situation. They'll jump on each other. They'll run into walls. They'll do all sorts of things. So they have to use lead sheep. So they get sheep that know the way, that are given their treats, and know what to, to lead the other sheep right through the slaughter. And I had to think about it. And I said, wow, does Satan have agents that lead us through the slaughter? Where we're thinking and we're looking at them and we're saying, well, everything's going good for them. And we're right on the wrong road. It could, they, they might look and they might see, oh, there's riches out there. They seem to have it all, and, and, and look, at, look where they're going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to model my life after them. And we're being taken straight for the slaughter. I'm sure that Satan has his, his agents out there, those lead sheep that are drawing others that same exact way. Um, we're going to have our, our closing song, and then uh, I'm going to continue with a point right after our, our song. Can I have our, uh, our closing song here? You know, as, as in my own experience, I, uh, I would like to relate to you a, a quick parable. And... Uh, I was raised for the majority of my life as a Seventh-day Adventist. My parents gave us a good home. But I knew Christ, I knew about Christ, but I did not know Christ. I knew about doctrines, but I did not know Him. And so the world had my attention and there's a parable that got my attention to want a new life I want you to imagine a wolf who doesn't want to be a wolf he sees and is convicted that the sheep have it they live longer lives they don't fight amongst themselves like the wolves do for the leader of the pack they have a shepherd who follows them, follows them around and protects them when other wolves come around. And I want to be like one of those sheep. I want to have a pastor. I don't want to hurt people anymore. So the sheep starts hanging around with, or the wolf starts hanging around with the flock. And he sees the, the sheep delighting in their grass. And as the sheep are delighting in their grass and chewing their cud, 
he is forcing himself to eat the way that they eat. He chews on the grass and wants to spit it out, but he, he tries. He wants to be one of the sheep. He tries to follow the shepherd, but he really wants to go out at night and howl at the moon. And things get hard for him, even though he lives among the sheep. He sees that others are scared of him, so he starts trying to dress like a sheep too. So he puts on uh, the lamb's clothing, and the other sheep aren't afraid of him anymore. And uh, when a few sheep are by themselves, he, he, in, he encourages them to come and live a little bit more like a wolf so he can let loose a little bit. That's how I felt as a, as a young man who was in the world. I wanted to be a Christian. I knew that it was what was right. But you could say, even though I was a vegetarian, <laughs> you could say I wanted the flesh of the world. And what was needed for me was a rebirth. A miracle. And I can tell you, it was a miracle. I searched, I prayed, I fasted. I said, Lord, make me new. I don't want this no more. I don't want to be like this. I'd fall on my knees and I'd pray, Lord, change me. And I'd come to a church and I'd go to the church and it was hard for me to leave and listen to what they were saying in the church, but I, want, I loved God. I, I had love inside of me and I wanted to follow God, but I had all these amusements in my mind that, wouldn't, that made things look boring to me. But I wanted God. I wanted to be a Christian. And I waited and I waited. And I said, when can I be washed? When are they going to ask if somebody would be baptized? Because I wanted to be baptized. Have you ever looked back on your past and said, oh, man, I wish I could push the rewind button and I wish I could replay and do things the right way. I wish I could be washed clean. Do you, do you look back and you have guilt? Well, I could say I did. And I, I knew that I could not name all the sins I had ever, ever done. And I would never remember them. So I waited and I said, Lord, I want to be made new. And only by the mir a miracle can a wolf be turned into a lamb. Amen. Only by a miracle. One who loves violence can be turned into one who hates violence. And that's exactly what happened to me. I used to love watching horror movies and turning off the lights and putting the sound up so I'd get scared. Brothers and sisters, if that repulses me. But at one time, I liked that kind of thing. But I'm not that wolf anymore who delights in suffering or seeing people get hurt. I'm the, I have been changed by Jesus into someone new. That doesn't mean I'm, I am there yet by no means. But God has changed me. Now I want to ask you, when was that time? Have you been broken on Christ? Have you made the decision, Lord, take it all. I don't want this no more. Take it and give me a new heart. That's where we need. And we cannot be hidden. 
we will be like the light on a hill, drawing others to Christ. Nicodemuses will be coming to us at night <laughs> and asking us, what is it about you? Why are you different? Well, there's good news. There is an institution called baptism. Many uh, dismiss it as a formality, but not God. And that's, it doesn't end with baptism, but it continues by letting the word do its work in our life. Amen. And that is a continual uh, growing as children of Christ. So what I'd like us to do is if there is anyone who wants that commitment or recommitment of if, if someone would like to be baptized, I'd ask if, if you would come to this side, but if you just want to make a commitment to God and say, Lord, take it all, I'd like you to come forward and let us kneel together and let's have a, a prayer of consecration because God has a work to do in us and he has a, God, a work to do through us as a body united. And we have to come to the point where we're ready to let go of self in the world and live for him. And so that's what I, I invite you to do. If there's those who would like to come forward and do that recommitment, come forward with me and let's nail together. And if there is anyone who would like that washing, and I, I know I waited for a long time. I waited for a long time until somebody called me and, and, uh, and I made that decision. Let's nail down. Father, Lord, you are so merciful, so good, so kind. You've provided every way for us, and you haven't given up on us. You send your Holy Spirit to speak to us every morning, every day, every night, wooing us to you and calling towards us because you love us. Lord, you came to this world to save sinners. You died for us while we were yet sinners. Lord, you didn't come to save the righteous. You came to save the lost. Help us identify. Help us to get uh, an idea of where we truly are, Father. You've told in us that we've, we live in the age of, of Laodicea. And we have to be careful that there's a straight testimony. And Father, Lord, I ask that, that we would heed that straight testimony. And that we would, we would get the ice off and we buy the gold that's tried in the fire. Lord, that you purify our characters. Help us to see what is in us that needs to go. And help us to let it go. Give us repentance. Father, if there are those here today that, that are making a, a decision, Lord, Lord to, to start a new life. Father, I ask that, that you would bless their decision, that you would strengthen them with a new strength, that you would keep in their mind, Father, a, a hope of a new beginning, and Lord, a new uh, realization of the conviction of the sins that we, have and, that we have and we have to let go of, so that we could be your faithful people that has no curse against them as we enter into the, the spiritual Canaan that you have for us, Lord. Father, prepare us, and I ask that you bless each one here. I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.